Hi, this is Ben Schreiber, and you are watching the Bubble Sort Analysis video, the second video in the series of three, where you will learn the concept of Big O and how to apply it to Bubble Sort. So, let's get started. Today, we're going to be discussing Bubble Sort, which is a sorting algorithm that takes in a list of values and sorts them such that the lowest values are on the left of the list and the highest values are on the right. So our agenda today, first we're going to review the algorithm procedure. If this doesn't make sense, please check out the intuition video that comes before this one. Next we're going to do a big O analysis for both runtime and memory. Don't worry if you don't know what this means yet. And lastly we will discuss when it is best to use bubble sort, which you will discover is rarely the case. Here is the bubble sort procedure. So for each position moving left to right, but the very last position, if the value at the current position is greater than the one at the next, you swap. Otherwise, you do not. So let's perform step one on the following list. First, we are at position zero, and we will compare the value at that position and position one, the next position. We see two is greater than one, so we swap them. Now we are at position one, and since the value there, 2, is less than the value at position 2, 3, we don't swap them. Next, we move to position 2 as our current position. We see that the value there, 3, is less than the value at position 3, 4, so we don't swap them. And that concludes step 1 of bubble sort. Step 2 notes that if you made at least one swap in step 1, then you should repeat the whole procedure starting from step 1. However, if you didn't make any swaps, you can be sure that the list is sorted. So here we see that in addition to actually sorting the list, step one also checks to see if the list is sorted. This means that in our example, we would need to go through the whole procedure again in order to verify that the list is sorted because in step one, we made a swap. When we analyze the memory and time efficiency of an algorithm, we use a notation called big O, which measures the performance of an algorithm relative to the size of the input list. So the performance can be measured in uh, the amount of steps the algorithm makes or the amount of time elapsed, or it can be measured in the amount of memory needed. Uh, we will both do a time and memory analysis here. So um, in the visual, we see different relationships and algorithms performance can have, in this case time, with the size of the input list. So some algorithms have a, a logarithmic relationship, others have a constant relationship, uh, some have a linear relationship, and so on. So there are many different types of relationships and algorithms performance can have with the size of the input list. And we're going to study that in bubble sort. So when we do this sort of analysis, we see how many steps and how much memory bubble sort will need for a generic list of size n. We'll do these analyses separately. Once we have determined this, we omit constant coefficients and remove any terms that are dominated as the input list size tends toward infinity. So let's look at an example. Say we determined that an algorithm took 4n squared plus n steps. We first omit constant coefficients. 4 is a coefficient of the quadratic term. And then we remove any terms that are dominated as the input list size tends toward infinity. How do you determine this? Well, you plug in increasingly large values for n. So you plug in 100, 1,000, a million, and so on. And you notice which term increases faster. If you plug in increasingly large values for n, will the quadratic term increase faster? Or will the linear term increase faster? Well, the quadratic term is definitely going to increase faster, which means that it will dominate and the linear term can be omitted. So now n squared is all that's left and we can categorize this algorithm, I'm not saying bubble sort, 
just uh, any algorithm that we determine that uses 4n squared plus n steps to be O of n squared. So how much time or how many steps does bubble sort take to execute? Well, bubble sort performs better in some situations than other. Some lists are much better suited than others of the same size. This means that bubble sort is adaptive. In other words, it adapts itself to certain conditions to perform better than other conditions. So when we analyze bubble sort in terms of big O, we consider how many comparisons of values it will make on a generic list of size n. So if you remember in the initial big O slide we looked at, there was a graph showing um, time the algorithm uses against the input size of the list. So here our unit of time or steps will be comparison. So we're going to look at how many comparisons the algorithm makes against the size of the input list. Bubble sort's best case is on a list that is already sorted. Here it'll compare the values at position 0 and position 1, position 1 and position 2, and all the way up to position n minus 2 and n minus 1. So since each position is going to be greater than the one before it, uh, it will not swap them. And as it iterates through all positions except the last, it will note that it made zero swaps which means that it will not loop again. Um, so in total, this will amount to n minus 1 comparisons, which yields linear or O of n runtime in the best case. So we see here that n is the linear term, 1 is the constant term. Uh, if we plug in increasingly large values for n, the linear term will clearly increase more rapidly than a constant term. So we can just omit the 1, and that yields O of n. Here we're going to bubble sort these bubblegum names in alphabetical order. And as we go along, we're going to count the number of comparisons we make and the number of swaps we make. First, we start at position 0. The value there is bubblicious and we compare it with the value of position 1 double bubble. B comes before D, so we don't need to make any swaps. Now we move to position 1. We compare the value there, double bubble, with the value of position 2, hubba bubba. D comes before H, so we don't need to swap there. Then we compare the value at position 2, hubba bubba, with the value of position 3, juicy fruit. H comes before J, so we don't need to swap there. So you can see that we have made three comparisons. We have four items in this list, so n equals four. And we haven't made any swaps, which means we don't need to iterate through the whole list again, which means that our result before that we would make n minus one comparisons is consistent here with the example. Now for the worst case runtime. Bubble sorts perform slowest on a list that is sorted in reverse order. We know from the best case analysis that looping through the list once amounts to n minus 1 comparisons. So on the initial loop, the item that was originally at position 0 will swap its way or bubble up to position n minus 1. On the next loop, the second largest item will bubble its way up to position n minus 2. So the largest n minus 1 items will bubble their way up to their correct respective positions, and it will take one loop per value. So after n minus one loops, the list will be sorted because after the largest n minus one values have bubbled their way up to their sorted positions, the nth largest or the smallest item will be in its correct location. However, since on the n minus one loop, one swap will occur, bubble sort will do an nth loop. So in total, this amounts to n 
times n minus 1 comparisons since we will do n loops and per loop there will be n minus 1 comparisons. So removing constant coefficients in non-dominating terms, we have n squared minus n. So this and this are the same thing. I'm just respelling it. We have n squared minus n, and we know that n squared is going to dominate n as we plug in increasingly large values for n. So we omit that. And we can categorize bubble sort as O of n squared runtime in its worst case. So here we're looking at the worst case runtime for a bubble sort when the list is in reverse order. And we're going to count comparisons and swaps per iteration as we did last time. We start at position 0, we compare juicy fruit to the value at position 1, hubba bubba. Juicy fruit should come after hubba bubba, so we swap them. Now we compare juicy fruit to double bubble. We see they should be swapped as well. Now we compare Juicy Fruit to Bubblicious. Again, they should be swapped. So you can see Juicy Fruit bubbled all the way from position 0 to position 3, which took 3 comparisons and 3 swaps. Next, we're going to see that Hubba Bubba will make its way from position 0 to position 2, since it's the second to last in alphabetical order. Now we go through this whole rigmarole again. So we first compare hubba bubba to double bubble we see that they should be swapped now we compare hubba bubba to bubblicious they should be swapped and now we compare hubba bubba with juicy fruit and we see that they should not be swapped we can see on this iteration hubba bubba bubbled its way up to position two which took three comparisons and since we made two swaps on this iteration we have to loop again. On this iteration, we start at position zero and we compare double bubble to bubblicious. We see that they should be swapped. Then we compare double bubble to hubba bubba. They should not be swapped. And last, we compare hubba bubba to juicy fruit and see that they should not be swapped. On this iteration, double bubble bubbled its way up to position one and we still made one swap. So we have to loop again, even though everything is in order. This will take another three comparisons. So each element besides the first, Bubblicious, had to bubble its way up to its sorted position, which took three comparisons each. Then we had to loop once more to check that the list was sorted, which took another three comparisons. In total, this amounts to three times four, or 12 comparisons which agrees with our finding that bubble sort will make n times n minus 1 comparisons in the worst case. In analyzing the memory usage of bubble sort, we need to consider values other than the input list, which we need to store. First, we need to know what position of the list we're at in the loop, which we kept track of with an underscore. We also need to know whether we made a swap during a given iteration. This is the minimum amount of values we need to store for bubble sort. So if we're going to do a big O analysis of this, we can express the memory usage in terms of the input list as 2 times n to the 0. At this point, there are no dominating terms to remove. There's only one term. And we drop the constant coefficient 2, which leaves us with n to the 0, which is equal to 1. So we can conclude that the memory usage is O of 1, meaning that bubble sort works in place. So it pains me to say this, but bubble sort is mostly used for educational purposes and not too many practical purposes. However, it is pretty quick on lists that are almost sorted. It runs in linear time, which is very good. but Insertion sort is still usually a better algorithm of choice, even in almost sorted lists. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. That was really bad.
What are the takeaways from this video? Well, for one, we learned how to do a big O analysis, and in doing this, we found that Bubble Sort performs well on a sorted list by only passing through the list once. This takes O of n time. However, when the list is sorted in reverse order, we have to wait for each element but the smallest to bubble its way up to the final position, and then do another check, which takes O of n squared time, very slow. Lastly, we learned that bubble sort only needs to store a couple of values, which doesn't change as the size of the input grows. So we say that bubble sort uses constant memory, or it works in place. I hope you now have a firm grasp of the concept of Big O and runtime analysis and memory analysis. So now you are fully equipped to understand the bubble sort song and apply it to code bubble sort whenever you need it, which is probably never, but still worth it.